VR porn is being made and it is definitely awesome. So do you think the industry is going to continue to passively allow it or do you expect that VR leaders are going to start actively blocking uh, adult content on VR systems? The Rift is an open platform. We don't control what software can run on it. And that's a big deal. Thank you. Um, if you look back you know, a few decades, it's really interesting to see things where we don't have videos of a lot of different events because people just didn't have video. You only had it of important events first and then you had it available to everybody. And if you go back even further, there's things we don't have pictures of, or, you know, but the first pictures were of important things, important people, important events. I think it's going to follow a similar trend in virtual reality where first you're going to have important events, you know, like sporting events or uh, you know, speeches. This, being this panel. I mean, this panel, yeah. Anybody capturing but, this in 360 out there? But those, I mean, like, not necessarily a great example, but like Facebook's F8 conference, yep. they had a 360. Like, I would just say, like, when, when the phonograph was invented, everyone thought the killer use case of the phonograph was going to be recording the words of the dying, the last, right, the last sentences. Like, that was going to be the use case. And I think we're kind of, uh, from a, a popular media and um, uh, rules and regulations standpoint, you know, in a similar place where we've got a lot to sort out. Um, and then back to what Palmer said. I agree. <laughs> Great. Well, I'll take a stab at this next one, but it may end up the same way. Uh, for anybody here, what's your answer to critics who say that VR's uh, effects on human physiology is not well studied enough to be put out to the mass market? I would say they don't know what they're talking about, you know, because it's been out there for longer than the phone. I mean, it's the same people that are saying that I put my phone to my ear. They don't have any research to back it up. And the same thing is we've been doing... VR, you know, and Palmer, you know, talking about going to USC, you know, the, the, the VR being in use in military, in medical, in, in medical, you know, simulation, medical training, it's been in PTSD treatment for 30, almost 30 years now. There's so much information about it. It's nonsense. Nobody's going to say anything. <laughs> try, let's try one more here. <laughs> Carl told me why Amir can, can was on the panel. Can we go back to the in-store demos? That the in-store yeah. demos like, question. Like, let's go back to in-store yeah, demos. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I'm actually happy to talk about in-store demos if you'd like. But the, uh, no, I, so, I mean, one approach would be make it really easy for anyone to like, get a taste of VR. Uh, you know, like build something out of an inexpensive material and then like, send it up to other people. Uh, 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 That's a good idea. Yeah, we could we do, that. do that. We, yeah, we should do that. Um, <laughs> No, so I, I and I, I actually think to be clear, uh, uh, cardboard and what it provides is, is a taste, is a glimpse of what you experience in. Sorry, guys, is a uh, just a, a taste of what you experience in an Oculus Rift or a Vive. Sorry, I don't know why this keeps going off. Um, can I maybe just have a hand mic? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, just a taste of what you experience in one of the higher end systems, but I think it's enough to get people interested, right? I think a lot of people have had their first, oh, this is cool moment. Um, and, and that drives future interest in higher end systems and so on. Um, I think the other, the other thing is, like, how many of you, when you got your first uh, DK1, DK2, when you had friends over, you're like, you gotta see this, right? It's like, no one? No one did that? We don't <laughs> have friends. No one? Oh, right? Everybody. Yeah, everyone did that, right? And so I think there's gonna be a natural, um, just enthusiasm from people who've seen it once, uh, uh, and these devices are going to be in market soon, um, right, nine months from now, um, and I, I think uh, that will drive as much growth, interest, and so on as, you know, having some, like, awkward in-store demo, um, though I think there's a place for that. So, anyway. One question um, I've had is how do we call cardboard in its current incarnation and what DK2 or Vive are doing all the same thing? Is that confusing for consumers? Um, I, I think it's, uh, there's a spectrum. People ask about, um, you know, what will perfect VR, or what is real VR like, and well, is, is it real VR when you can still tell that you're in a headset and not like experiencing reality directly? Um, and uh, uh, again, you know, we have no illusions that cardboard is, uh, provides the same level of experience, right? Um, the, 
I think I just mean from a marketing perspective, like communicate. Not a, not a. It's not a dig. It's more. Sure. Of a, how do we explain this to regular people, right? Because they get this, you, you know, festival experience. You want me to cool to say how we explain it to regular? What's that? People? You want me to say how we explain it because we have to talk. I would. I would love that. <laughs> For the purpose of taking it away from you, explaining the, the Google AI. Sure, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm happy so to we, we are we, we, we have to explain cardboard because we work with, with, uh, with cardboard, which the good thing about cardboard is allows you to use any phone. You don't have to be locked to a specific, a specific phone. So when, you, when I, I go to people, and, and, uh, and again, we, we went to New York and we had like you know, four different you know, uh, stops for the, for the media. The first one was cardboard because cardboard is the least threatening. You take the cardboard. First of all, I show them that I just bought it for five bucks from Amazon. They love that. They take it, they put it on, and they see the, the experience, you know, you're running in the streets. They immediately realize, okay, VR is something different than what we imagined. They don't, especially for those that never, ever experienced any, anything like it. it. It is an icebreaker. For me, for a developer, for all your platforms, it's an icebreaker. Then I can persuade that nice lady from, from, uh, from this uh, marketing uh, you know, publication that you know, for her, the hairdo was just an investment of 500 bucks to come in and put Gear VR on, knowing that what she just experienced on, 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 on cardboard, it's making it worth it. Now she's putting gear on. Now she's having, a, 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 you know, a, an experience. Now she, we had the wild, you know, we, we got the wild uh, from Fox. We put her in the, into the wild in, in, the, in gear. So step one, step two. Then we took her to the DK2. And then we continue with our multi-user and the, and the virtual commerce experience. Yeah. But the point is, every piece of it is critical. The fact that they are almost in a million hands is helping you more than all the marketing dollars that anybody allowed you to spend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that no, I, I, that was, uh, <laughs> that was, uh, no, I, thank you, Amir. I mean, we've been focused on making uh, VR, a taste of VR, accessible to anyone, easy, approachable, and so on. And in fact, we, you know, we made a lot of very conscious decisions early on with Cardboard about the actual design of it. It does not have a head, have, have a head strap. It won't have a head strap because, right, it should be easy to put on, take off. Um, and just as importantly, right, you, we know uh, that right, the motion of your torso, you can rotate about one-fourth the speed of your head, makes it a much more comfortable experience. We obviously had the decision to make wider field of view optics when we started, but we made them narrow, it was more comfortable and so on. And so we've been thoughtful about making sure that, you know, cardboard is a good introduction, um, again, to the ramp of VR. Um, I, I'm not sure what specific word we use for it other than that, but that's how we think about it at Google. All right, well, uh, let's continue along on our way here. See if I can go for three strikes. Um, adult virtual reality, AKA porn. Who wants to talk about it? <laughs> Nobody? I think Amir has some thoughts on this subject. <laughs> well, so uh, I, this, I, is, this is the- I do. This is the crux <laughs> of the question. I this do. is the part where I need to go, I think. And, I mean, this- no, I, I tell you, just to, to make it very simple and quick. It's all about, you know, go, go back in history and you look any new medium and every, every medium in the past, you know, uh, porn is, is, a, is a key driver. Now, for some reason, or maybe for good reason, I don't know, but in, in Japan, uh, VR and porn is, is, is big. Palmer will not say anything, but he knows that a lot of his dev kids went to, went to Japan, or at least, I don't know if he knows, but we know. <laughs> And I'm letting you know. They went to Japan, and, 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 but not only Japan. People are going to work on it because it's going to make a lot of money. You know, I can tell you that we are talking now, not porn, but, you know, it's interesting enough. Uh, can you imagine um, our uh, virtual commerce, our virtual retail application for the Victoria's Secret brand? Just imagine that great experience of, of shopping for Victoria's Secret product. Hey, in so a, back to in-store demos. Yeah. <laughs> in Victoria's Secret. Well, but for marketing. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> no, I was just trying to change the subject. Yeah. yeah. There's, yeah, a yeah. there's a lot of other Next, good the, use uh, cases. Go next. Yeah. A lot of other good use cases. Yeah. Well, so so this is kind of my my point here. The re the reluctance to address this, which is surely, it's, I mean, the adult industry is not a small industry by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, do you think it's potentially a mistake to? I mean, is it just out of necessity that big brands can't necessarily be associated with? with that industry that, that you have to leave behind, or does it not actually have value in, in your mind? I feel like the next question, I feel like the next question you're gonna ask is like, can you guys give us a list of patents and trademarks you may be <laughs> infringing on? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, there's a progression here. Yeah. Uh, I'm scared of the next question. All right, yeah. all, right. Uh, all right. I see actually, uh, yeah. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's keep it going then. So something to think about. These hey, guys ben, aren't gonna hey, do ben. it, somebody else should. When are you going to move from Philadelphia? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. I'll put that website up soon so you guys can get an answer to that question. All right. Um, so when it comes to performance for VR applications, um, if, you, if you consider a smartphone, let's say, somebody doesn't optimize their just normal smartphone app for one phone over another, and somebody downloads it, and they play it, and, oh, it runs slowly. It loads slowly. It's just it's not a good user experience. But when it comes to VR, those same mistakes go from just something that's not fun to something that can actually be dizzying and, and, uh, and nauseating, and it's not a fun experience by any stretch of the imagination. Do you think that it's necessary to have some minimum bar of performance uh, to make sure that people who are getting their first demos aren't experiencing something uh, that actually makes them sick and turns them off for the rest of, you know, they never want to buy one? I think we're beyond the point of turning people off to the point of never wanting to try it again. Like maybe a year or two or three, it was a much more fragile environment where virtual reality was new enough that you could potentially turn enough people off to really hurt the industry. At this point, I think it's very likely that people will just write it off as a very bad virtual reality experience. And it may take them longer to seek out better virtual reality. It may, they may not have immediate interest, but in the long run, you know, for the, for the long term, long-term future of virtual reality, I think we are largely past that mark, where you have to worry about killing you know, people's interest forever. Yeah, and I think one of the smart things that uh, Oculus and Samsung have done, the kind of comfort uh, index in the Gear VR apps, right? It gives you an immediate read on what kind of experience you're gonna have, and I think there's an even kind of lower level bar uh, that, that you can set um, to make sure that, right, frame rate and so on is performing, you have a good experience. Um, I, I think ultimately you need to give developers the tools to measure and understand um, how their apps are performing and also educate developers about the importance of not dropping frames and maintaining 60 frames per second and not freezing head tracking and all of the things that you just have to get right. And uh, you know, one of, one of the things I find very exciting about forums like this is it's an opportunity um, to kind of train up the world on this, share learnings and so on. Um, and I think it's kind of on all of us to help the world get better at developing these applications. We're not there yet. So as we're approaching uh, the launch of this stuff, you know, we have some obvious use cases. We have social, we have gaming, there's video. What do you guys see uh, that is a really cool potential use case that's just not receiving all that much attention as we, as we kind of lead up to, to a big launch, if any? I think the use cases are very focused on entertainment right now. It's, it's, of course, right now, because of the current generation of, of hardware, we are on mobile again, specifically mobile. We are focused on, you know, uh, movies and, you know, 360 on their uh, desktop applications. But, uh, you know, I look at, at uh, uh, we have, we just crossed uh, 16,000 to 16,100 16, developers that downloaded and working with us and, and, and told us what is the application they're working on, not the application, the specific category, the industry. And I can tell you less than 20% are entertainment. The majority, actually not the majority, but over 35%, it's in education and training. The next uh, category is health, digital health. You know, people are developing applications that I think are gonna revolutionize healthcare with VR. I think that what I've seen people are doing for autism, I, you know, if, you, if you saw, I have goosebumps right now when I, when I think about what this is gonna do to autism, uh, education, the personalization of treatment for kids with any kind of, of, of behavior uh, issues. And, and, and that's just the beginning. I think you have education, training, you have 
healthcare, these are the applications. I recommend all of you to find a guy called Walter Greenleaf, which is probably speaking in one of the panels. He's my advisor to everything to do with digital health, and he's been doing it for over 25 years with Stanford, and, and he is by far going to be the, the one that's going to lead the best advancements in, in VR use. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, the enterprise applications, enterprise simulation, I think that these, all of these devices are disruptive, low-cost simulation technologies that can you know, destroy what's going on now in the, in the enterprise simulation space. And there's a huge opportunity to change how people work and work and learn and, and all those things. Um, the second, I, I think that uh, Palmer's friend, uh, Shari from uh, uh, Sundance, right, uh, was really a pioneer in the VR filmmaking. Uh, that's such a huge medium and, and it's going to be really, really interesting for a long time. And then the third one, which I don't think gets very much attention, although I like to say it in these forums, hoping somebody smarter than me uh, comes up with it, is it's sort of like the Instagram Twitter, like an application or a service that is native to the platform that it was born from and you can't really imagine it on a different platform. Those types of um, solutions for VR where it's like, oh, this is what you use VR for. Like, camera phone, 10 years until Instagram showed up. Now it's like, oh, that's what you use a camera phone for. I got it. Okay, cool. Um, and so that's what I'm hoping for, um, you know, out of this community as, as this scales up. I'm going to be contrarian. I'm going to say that there are very few applications where virtual reality isn't getting attention. Like to say, you know, where are things not getting enough attention? Things like PTSD treatment, autism treatment, mental health treatment, enterprise, simulation, military, medical. I'd say they're all getting tons of attention. It's not, really? there, there's no media blackout on these things. And in fact, I think they're probably getting more media more. attention than they would even, I don't, I want to say deserve, but I guess than they would normally warrant just on the size of their market. I mean, you could dominate the entire medical virtual reality market. There's a lot of dollars in it, but there's not going to be a lot of companies, especially with the current regulatory environment and how these kinds of treatments go out there. There's going to be a couple players making a ton of money, but it's not going to be a lot of headsets. It's not going to be a lot of developers. That pie is going to be a decent pie split between a few people, probably led by people in the medical industry who already know how to regulate navigate that crazy regulatory environment. Same thing for enterprise, same thing largely for military simulation. Despite that, it gets a ton of attention, more so than the entertainment and, I, like I'd say education fits, fits in here too. They get a lot of attention compared to the probably one to two percent of the market that they're going to get. And there's two ways to think of it, in the long term and in the short term. In the very short term, entertainment is going to absolutely dominate the things that are done in virtual reality. It's going to be by far the largest segment for sure. In the very long term, entertainment and education are probably going to be the two biggest things that everyone uses. Military, enterprise, all that. It's going to remain a very tiny market as a whole. And that's one of the reasons we're seeing virtual reality coming back so fast. It's not because of enterprise, military, or medical. If, if those industries were enough to drive virtual reality or be a significant part of the industry, they could have driven the technological advances themselves. But that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing companies like Samsung get interested because finally there's consumers, hundreds of millions, potentially billions of consumers who want to use this in their everyday life. And you know, enterprise, military, emergency response training just doesn't fit into their everyday life. It's going to end up being probably a very small portion of the pie. And that's one of the reasons that we see the military and medicine moving towards standard consumer equipment, you know, with different encryption technologies, uh, you know, and, and making applications that make it more of a fit. But uh, pilots are using iPads in the cockpit now. Doctors are using iPads for the, all kinds of, of, of medical uses and checking patient documents. Uh, that Barack never would have. Barack Obama is BlackBerry. Yeah, and, and that didn't happen, <laughs> and, and it's extremely secure. But yes. the technology wasn't driven by government or by the military or by medicine. It was driven by consumers, and they latched on to save money and do a better job. I think VR is going to kind of follow a similar path. Consumer VR is what's going to drive all of these things. Everyone else is going to kind of hitch on the back and make quite a bit of money off it. But I don't think that uh, I don't think that they're missing out on media attention that they warrant. I agree with that. The shift, the shift that I see that I think is so exciting is, whereas maybe in the 90s, VR was like, oh, how could we apply this kind of bizarre, narrow technology to some uh, weird use case like oil drilling or uh, like automotive design? It's like, how many people design cars? Like, not, not that many. Um, instead, the, the kind of world is now asking the question, okay, virtual reality, uh, what is the use case for reality? And thinking about 
the use cases in reality, and it turns out reality is useful for a whole lot of things. And I, I think we see that in, in the diversity <laughs> of, uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, non-controversial statement. And, uh, and, and, and obviously, when, right, it's not only what is the use case for reality, but things that you couldn't do without synthetic realities, um, training and so on, that would be impossible uh, or costly or you know, violent or ugly or other ways. Uh, to, to actually do in, in real life. And so um, I think that, that mindset shift is one of the reasons we see um, such broad interest from, and we've hit on all the things here. If I can counter that just, you know, I, I'd say it's not just that there's been a mindset shift. Uh, you said, you know, in the 90s, people were trying to shoehorn virtual reality into yeah. these industries because it was a hot new thing. I would say we actually suffer from that problem a lot more. Like, there's a lot of sane people using it for reasonable things, but I'd say there's more people now trying to shoehorn virtual reality into places it doesn't really have a place uh, than even in the 90s, because it's, it, it is much bigger than it was back then. And one of the things that we have to deal with is... My we, point was more about there being now a, a pull, right? Yes. Maybe an overpull. Uh, instead of uh, well, mo like most push. people are pulling in the yeah. right direction. Yeah. It's not just this group pulling in the wrong yeah. direction. But I, I mean, it is worth thinking about. There are a lot of people, I think, trying to shoehorn virtual reality into their latest thing, whether it's their marketing campaign or their you know their movie campaign yeah. or trying to make it part of their fitness tool. And they're not doing it because it's really a good fit. Virtual reality it isn't a ma it, virtual reality is not a magical cure all that makes your product relevant or good. What? It's just the hippest new thing. And a lot of people are trying to hitch off, you know, making it that latest new thing. And like, look, you know, our, our startup, we, do a, we have a VR port of our application. It's poorly implemented. It doesn't add anything, but it's virtual reality. Social, local, mobile, and VR. Exactly. Done. Solo, mobile. Invest. <laughs> awesome. Solo, mobile, Slow VR. Mover. Slow, vro, I don't know. Anyway. But I, I mean, that... that, we, that we can do the anagram later, yeah. But I feel like that is something that's... Yeah. that's that's something to be aware of in VR, that there, VR is not a perfect solution to all problems in every business and every piece of software like some people imagine it is. It's, it really is only a good fit for certain things. And as it gets better, there's going to be industries that today don't make any sense that eventually yep. do make sense. So just uh, like to let everybody know as we move into our next question, I'm going to try to save some time at the end for questions. Uh, so keep your seats. We still have a couple more questions. But uh, we're going to try to get some from the audience. So start thinking about them. And let's try to keep them oriented toward the rise of consumer VR. So that opportunity will come soon. Uh, so the next thing I'd like to talk about is actually probably applies to a lot of people in this room and maybe people uh, who will hear uh, from outside of this room who are kind of on the, on the edge of this industry, very interested, uh, but maybe not necessarily working in it. Maybe they want to be working in it. Um, the industry doesn't build itself. And while we have a whole bunch of talented people who have uh, jumped in there, there's surely going to be even more talent just from an employment standpoint needed to power this crazy curve that this industry is on. What would you say to somebody who says, you know, I'm a, just a technical person, um, but I want to get involved in the market? What is kind of a really good entrance way for them to start learning? Where, where could they fit? What, what kind of people do you guys find that you need in your companies that uh, you maybe don't have enough of? comes down to the ability to develop and publish applications, which hopefully are going to be killer apps for mobile VR. For me, you know, if you are uh, Facebook or Oculus and you have the money to spend on AAA titles for PC, that's going to be you know, in the market you know, within the next two to three years, I mean, enough install base of PCs, that's great. But my message always for the last you know, over 18 months from the moment we realized that mobile VR is, is real, is just get yourself up and running on developing, for now, Android. We don't know what the hell these people from Cupertino are doing. But for now, Android, you know, between Google, Samsung, every other mobile OEM is in a race now chasing uh, Samsung. The bottom line is focus on developing applications. You will have hundreds of millions of VR-enabled uh, phones in the hands of consumers within the next two to three years. That's I, how you're going to monetize it. My perspective, what's exciting That's a very aggressive target. That, that, that's yeah, that was, I, uh, you know, that's I, I didn't know about those step. plans. Uh, yeah. Uh, what's exciting about VR for me is, uh, I think for the last kind of 10 years, a, a lot of uh, what happened uh, with the uh, rise of 
tech companies, internet companies, is you kind of, you're gonna go study computer science if you wanted to participate in, in the core of that. Um, software development and so on. And VR is so broad in, in a couple dimensions that uh, like electrical engineering and really understanding uh, things all the way down to the silicon uh, is, is directly important to uh, the, the future of VR. Um, as are other kind of arcane, uh, arcane disciplines, um, optics um, and systems integration and so on. Um, they're the more obvious things, computer vision, um, high performance graphics and rendering and so on. What's just as exciting about kind of the breadth of technical skills needed um, to participate in VR is actually the importance of uh, the creative side, again. And I think we're gonna see a real uh, kind of renaissance in uh, creative direction, um, uh, 3D animation and rendering, uh, film. Um, and if, if you're, I don't remember if it's left brain or right brain, but if you're more creatively inclined than technically inclined, I think there's tremendous opportunity, whether you're in film school or learning how to um, kind of uh, get great things from Maya or RenderMan or whatever, um, to really go deep on how do you participate, how do you build beautiful, engaging experiences for this new medium? Um, and so just the, just the breadth of the skill set uh, needed, I think, to bring up not only the hardware, but the software to actually run it. And then um, I think just as importantly, beautiful, uh, uh, compelling um, content, whether that's kind of more uh, cinematography um, or interactive games and so on, I think it, it, it's, it's gonna require a, uh, a very broad range of skill sets. And I think it's pretty cool for that reason. On the angle of the creativity, the whole world is sort of oriented in this rectangle, right? A stage is a rectangle, and television is a rectangle, and a movie theater is a rectangle. And so you go and try to film a concert in VR, and it's like, oh, I, I don't know. It's not as good as like it probably could have been, right? So it's, as the, as you think about the storytelling, just changing everyone's frame from how you tell a story that's around you, whether it's a game or a film or, a, or educational or whatever, an interface. Um, it's just a paradigm shift as we, you know, 80 years of maybe longer of thinking of things in rectangles. And uh, it's such a kind of weird warped thing that I've kind of got myself into here. So I'm going to stop now. I'd say it's the people in the games industry that have that broad breadth of skills, the people who understand hardware deeply, that also understand creativity deeply, and who understand how to make real-time immersive 3D environments. I mean, there's, there's going to be people from outside the games industry getting into virtual reality for sure, but I think that what you're gonna see more of is people from the games industry getting into other parts of VR, whether it's real-time cinema, education, or even you know health, military. All these people, I think, are going to come from the games industry for the next few years, not because they're necessarily you know, the perfect skill set, but because they're the only people out there in the world with a very closely matching skill set to what you need to make really great virtual reality content. That might change over time, like you're starting to see schools already uh, having their film programs considerations for immersive media. And that's gonna be really interesting to have people coming out of college and into the workforce with knowledge of virtual reality and creating content from the start. But uh, the, the games industry is powering every facet of the virtual reality industry right now, even outside of games. So those are, those are the people that, like, if you want to get into virtual reality, you should get into all of the things that are related to games. Like you said, you know, learning how to use tools, learning how to tell stories, learning how to make really beautiful things. It's basically the same skill set right now. So with that, <coughs> uh, we've got about 15 minutes left, and I'd love to get some questions from the audience. Uh, Bruce, let's see. Can we get some mics set up? Uh, Bruce, do we want to get lines going, or what's the best? Uh, Yes, let's go ahead and do that. Let's have some people come up with lines and uh, get a line in, in each of the center end. columns here for people with questions. Appreciate it. And just a reminder, we are focusing on the rise of consumer VR. And awesome. other controversial subjects that Ben decided. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> apparently. So controversial. <laughs> Starting over here. Uh, Lee from uh, Passing Lane Media. Uh, one of the things that I've been looking at are early opportunities, obviously, uh, as, as Lucky eloquently put it, we're all going to hitch on to the back end of VR and monetize. Um, I find it interesting that we have, I'm going to say probably 90% male audience here. <clears throat> we have 100% male panel, and uh, no one wanted to discuss adult entertainment. Uh, it's not my industry, I'm mainly automotive. Um, but I think it's interesting, one of the things that I look at is, uh, sort of the VHS and beta war, and the fact that 
uh, adult entertainment, I think, backed VHS. Everyone ended up with VHS players. Beta, although it was a better product, fell to the wayside. I think we may see that with um, Apple uh, and their closed, I guess, system that they have. Uh, and it makes it very difficult to put files on. And whereas on the, you know, Android open source platform, you can drag and drop files. There you go. There's no one locking out the VR content, so you don't have these gatekeepers like you do with Apple. Um, do you guys see adult entertainment as a major driver like it was with VHS and beta and like it was with uh, e-commerce adoption early on? People were not spending a lot of money with e-commerce in the early 90s. Once adult content came on, people were quick to put their credit cards in. So uh, do you guys see the adult entertainment industry as something that's going to drive VR for consumers forward or, uh, or not? I guess that's the a, that's a question. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think I mean, Ben it, Ben's question was not good enough. It, it's also worth it, it, it's worth noting uh, that the VHS and Betamax example isn't bulletproof. People often bring it. You know, it, 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 that's not to say that it's necessarily an argument for one way or the other. But it's not necessarily apparent that strong support by the by the standard providers for a particular kind of entertainment is critical to the success of that technology. The articles I've read say that the influence of the adult industry is overblown in size and the influence on it is overblown. So I just like, it's not something I spend any time thinking about. Any other in industry will, will, you know, they'll have to examine the possibilities, what it's going to do for their industry. And if it's good for them, they're going to make money, of course they're going to pour, in, come into it. But let's not talk about it too much. It's enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to our next question. Uh, over here. Okay, uh, I thought he was going to ask it, but then he went in a different direction. 90% men, 100% white men up on the stage. This is a brand new industry with an opportunity not to look like every other industry. And I think I heard from you, Palmer, something that worries me, which is if the gaming industry is going to take this over, the gaming industry has had a terrible track record in terms of diversity, a terrible track record in terms of treating women equally. It's really been a disaster. and to the point that the gentleman from Google made, if you guys actually want to make good, compelling content in this space, it has to be content that's for everybody, and it's not going to be engineers, it's not going to be people who are good with polygons, it's going to be storytellers, or we won't buy the headsets. So each of you have companies that either you own or work for. Are you guys making attempts to actually diversify your workforce, diversify your creatives, and not look like the same old bunch of white guys? I emphatically agree with the spirit of the question. Uh, I emphatically agree with the spirit of the question, and, and I agree, and uh, I am but one person from our team, uh, and not everyone looks like me, and I, I think it's going to be incredibly important um, to bring something meaningful uh, to the world, and by the world I mean everyone, right, uh, to, to bring something that everyone finds value in, uh, that resonates with everyone, to have a very diverse group of uh, people bringing that technology and those experiences to bear. That's certainly our goal at Google, and I'd be shocked if it wasn't. Uh, the goal of the others up here as well. Yeah, I mean, to the to the end, Milk VR is being programmed as a as a mainstream uh, media outlet. We just launched uh, three separate series with Refinery Twenty Nine. Which raise your hand if you know what Refinery Twenty Nine is in the room. Uh, it's going to be pretty uniform. Uh, who doesn't know and who does know of that group? Um, and so we're trying we're trying really hard to make a user experience that's easy, uh, content that appeals to different groups of people. Um, and uh, think of things uh, just beyond the sort of uh, typical sort of, you know, young male gamer uh, world that is very natural and, and obviously desirable for VR as, a, as an emerging medium, but is not the only market. We are fully focused on enabling, uh, for, for commercial reasons, to enable uh, content uh, to be uh, focused on uh, women. Uh, and the main reason is that women make most of the decisions what people buy at home, what families buy. And uh, whether it's buying entertainment products or even buying, uh, specifically for families, buying education or just buying, like e-commerce. And what we have done, uh, we specifically teamed with a company. Uh, we, we were talking to both Omnicom and uh, Publicis, which is the two largest advertising companies in the world. And then Publicis gave us a, a creative director 
um, which is their creative director that runs VR. And uh, Sepia and Nitro, again, one of the largest advertising companies in the world, uh, you know, she is a brilliant storyteller. She, and she is, without a doubt, a woman. And, and, and she is, without a doubt, focused on telling stories about fashion and telling stories and, and, and t stories about, about uh, uh, family and telling stories about brands. And she believes, and specifically the whole Sepia Nitro team, believe all the way up to the, to the new owners of the company with uh, publicists that there is a unique opportunity in telling stories and telling stories to their consumers and their consumers, you know, to, to their clients, consumers, and that is the majority of those are women. Give a non-fashion example, the producer of uh, our NBA Keys to the Game uh, show is uh, named Nancy Bennett from 2-Bit Circus. Uh, she's one of the best filmmakers out there, so. Uh, hopefully she gets some work off of that plug. Nancy. It's also worth noting that this isn't a this isn't a short term problem. I mean, it's easy to say, oh, you know, we yeah, we support diversity. Yes, we want to have more women or you know more of any group in the virtual reality industry. But I do stand by what I said, where virtual reality is going to be driven largely by the games industry, not because of the attitude of the games industry or because of the people they hire. The reality is that most people with the skills required to make real-time 3D environments and to make compelling stories are in that games industry. A lot of the, whether you see it as a positive or a negative, a lot of that character is going to come into the virtual reality industry. If we want more people in the VR industry, I think there's a big opportunity as it expands to more people than just gamers. But when I said you know, that, that it's based on the games industry, it doesn't mean that that's the content that's going to come out of it. I think that you know, and if you're a good creative and you're in the games industry, you can make content for any market. It doesn't have to be for you know, young, white gamer guys. It can be for anybody. Uh, but the industry also isn't going to change overnight. If there's a certain composition, especially if it's dominated by that, you know, by that group, it's going to be very difficult to achieve real balance without you know, trying to solve the core of the problem and looking at it in a more long-term way. Um, and building on what Amir says, I think that it's going to be, a lot of it is going to be market driven. Women are going to want to use virtual reality too. It's not going to be just a thing for men. And while there might be a lot more men in the games industry right now, as virtual reality expands, it's natural that there will be content that appeal to both genders or to women or to any other group because that's the way, gonna be the way to make money. Um, yeah, but, but we must do some, some serious uh, kind of division between you know, and I'm, you have desktop VR and you have mobile VR. I agree with uh, Palmer on the desktop VR. It is gonna be gaming. Only gamers will be willing to spend the kind of money it takes to buy those PCs. Just, that's actually not what I'm saying at all. No, I didn't say, I, that's, I, I didn't say that's what you're saying. I'm saying that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but, but I'm going with you, you on, said, the, as Palmer on the said. fair that, as Palmer <laughs> said, on the gaming. Now, gaming, Desktop VR will be driven, in my belief, my belief is, is strictly from gamers. I believe there's other applications, but the majority will be gamers and gaming developers. And, and, and for me, in mobile, you look at who uses, even who plays games on mobile devices, it comes down to there's, there's a very uh, big percentage, if not uh, equal percentage, women uh, uh, use entertainment on mobile devices. But again, you go and, uh, and, and look at what VR is enabling, I think women, both for development and, and development of content and applications and, and, and across all industries, I believe in, in, in mobile VR, gaming will be less than 20%. And I, you know, I put you know, interactive, which is what's gonna actually make VR successful, an interactive medium, you know, it's all gonna be in mobile and it's all gonna be across the board Every application, every every industry can benefit from VR. Thanks, Mayor. Let's go to our next question over here. So, to follow up on an earlier question, I guess this is the adult side of the room. Um, whether you feel comfortable acknowledging it or not, VR porn is being made, and it is definitely awesome. So, do you think the industry is going to continue to passively allow it, or do you expect that VR leaders are going to start actively blocking uh, adult content? on VR systems. The Rift is an open platform. We don't control what software can run on it. And that's a big deal. Thank you. That was good. 
That seems to be all. We'll take a question over here. Yeah, it's going in a different direction. Um, can you discuss the recommendation of minimum age requirement, how that might change? No. <laughs> Palmer says no. Anybody else? Minimum age requirement? Uh, or not requirement, recommendation. Recommendation, sure, whatever. The way, when people ask me at festivals and they want to put like a little kid in it, I'd say that the lens distance is sized for adults and it works better for that and that's why we, we try to sell it to adults. Got a question over here? Hey, um, so I have a question about something that was not touched on, upon as much, which is um, the combination of 360 cameras and then consumer VR allowing us to capture memories, like personal memories, photos and videos. I was wondering when you saw the revolution coming and the more content, personal content being created using that. And actually curious whether Samsung had any updates about the 360 pro project, uh, 360 camera project that was mentioned in the past. That was kind of came back around the side there on me. Uh, I mean, you know, definitely like big, uh, big fan of the three. You're looking at me in a very yeah. Funny I way. would like the yeah. update. I would, I'd like to know what's happening. It's going to be awesome. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think that in the production of 360 video is uh, very labor intensive today. Um, stitching, uh, you know, different video streams together, and certainly not in the realm of uh, you know your average user. And so the evolution towards consumer grade. Uh, you know, live stitch 360 video is a huge opportunity in the space and, and uh, presents exactly that vision of, you know, saving your memories and like really being able to experience it. I think it's going to be a big deal. You know, maybe not this year exactly, but, um, you know, it's a big deal. Yeah, like a, how far uh, away are we from that? Do you have an estimate? You talk to the camera guys, they got to hustle. Not the project specifically, yeah. but like personal <laughs> memories being captured. No, no, I don't, mean, I don't mean our camera guys. I mean camera guys in general. I mean, I think it's a technically complex problem. Uh, it's way beyond my expertise, um, but. Meaning you got, you got the, the top camera companies are jumping into it by making acquisitions. You have Samsung jumping into it. You got Sony jumping into it. Everybody is going to make the hardware now. It's clear. There's, a, there's an install base coming with mobile. They're going to make the hardware. And specifically for memories, there's a bunch of companies that are already developing, you know, your, your mom and your grandma to remember her, the pets. It's, I, I have like three different companies that are working on, you know, the memories of my pets. It's amazingly. I've seen that's, that's a more niche use of, of VR. Yeah. The, uh, I, uh, I actually, it's, it's one of the spaces and the applications of VR that I am personally most excited about. Not only capturing personal memories, but experiences and events and, and places that are important. And, uh, I think, uh, you know, somewhat unfortunately, we're kind of limited uh, on the camera side by like the laws of physics, where if you actually wanted to design a camera that could look with two eyes in every uh, direction, you just kind of run out of like atoms in space. Uh, and so I think there's actually going to have to be some pretty deep innovation on the software side um, so that uh, content creators aren't spending 80% of their time fixing stitching artifacts and, you know, removing the seam that, you know, cuts the person in half and so on. Um, and that's a big, deep, hard problem, and uh, I'm hoping someone will solve it. Well, it's a problem that has to be solved if you're going to have consumers capturing content. You, know, you can't expect them to have production level quality stuff. So you're going to need to have something that can actually, rather than just you know, capture a bunch of pictures and present them as a stereo feed to the eyes and let your brain work it out, you need to actually have hardware that can understand the environment, what, what the depth is, and properly capture it and then recreate it. Um, and then another side little note related to that is I think it's going to be interesting once we have proper 360 degree 3D capture technology to see what that does to um, our perception of other forms of, of, of media, like capturing events with pictures or videos. If you look back, um, if you look back you know, a few decades, it's really interesting to see things where we don't have videos of a lot of different events because people just didn't have video. You only had it of important events first and then you had it available to everybody. And if you go back even further, there's things we don't have pictures of, or, you know, but the first pictures were of important things, important people, important events. I think it's going to follow a similar trend in virtual reality, where first you're going to have important events, you know, like sporting events or uh, you know, speeches. This, being this panel. I, I mean, this panel, yeah. Is anybody capturing but, this in 360 out there? But those, I mean, like, the, the, not a necessarily a great example, but like Facebook's F8 conference, yep. they had a 360-degree capture system set up and streaming that in real time. 
um, that's where we're going to see this technology first, and then eventually it's going to go to the people and it's going to become accessible to people and capture their own personal memories. I look forward to a future, maybe a few decades from now, where we look back and say, God, until the 2020s, we like didn't have any immersive captures. Like It's I, all just pictures yeah, and videos. No, I think we'll it's actually, hard to understand what it was like to be, we'll, be alive we'll look, back then. We'll look back on, on uh, you know, the last 10 years, and until we have that device, the, the kind of memory capture device, um, is this time where, oh my God, it's like we, we lost out on you know, capturing uh, a birthday party or that special event or that moment in history. And uh, I don't know, I don't know when it'll be. What's that? The Super Bowl. Uh, the Super Bowl, right? The, the Olympics. Um, uh, but I think just as importantly, something personal and important, uh, a wedding, um, something like that. Uh, and we'll, we'll feel kind of like we feel now when something important wasn't caught on video or film. Um, this, this sense of, oh man, I wish, I wish we'd fully captured it. So Totally um, agree. Yeah, I, I look forward to that day when we're there. I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, some, in part because of the laws of physics, we're a, a, a few years away, um, at least for the truly consumer-grade uh, integrated product. So ready to lament? Are you, You're ready to what? Lament. Oh, no, I know. I, I am really ready to lament. Hey, guys, I'm really sorry for everybody in line, but we are out of time. Let's give our panelists wow. a round of applause here. Okay. Thanks for joining us, guys. Thank you.